Hi, this is Paul. I wanted to follow up on my video about objective morality, objective value. Uh, I'm going to bring in Matt Delahunty, not in person, but obviously via video, because actually he talks with this quite a bit, this topic of objective value or objective morality. And as my last video, I, I, I showed where Sam Harris very much is against uh, relativism, as is Matt Delahunty. They, at least according to Matt Delhunty, they're very much on the same page. Matt Delhunty, in his conversation with Jordan Peterson, says that he thought uh, Sam Harris put the put the argument better in the moral landscape than than Matt Delhunty has. But he does have videos out there on the question of objective value or objective morality. Now, in my last video, and I'm going to tie this in obviously to C.S. Lewis and the Abolition of Man. I've been re-listening to, re to Jordan Peterson, Matt Delahunty. I've been listening to some other Matt Delahunty videos. I've been re-listening to the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris conversations to try and find the best clips that most directly um, address these issues that are going on in this question. And in my last video, we're doing orientation of natural theology. In my N.T. Wright video, I brought in the definition of natural theology. What is natural theology? N.T. Wright in his Gifford lectures addresses that. And I pointed out that in terms of orienting ourselves from above, we have reason. That's Dillahunty, Sam Harris, Nobody's against reason, okay? And reason is, in a sense, from above. It transcends the particulars of what's going on down here below. But there's also that which is below. There's evidence. There's empiricism that we can find from below. And then we have access to the past, its record, and we call that history. And N.T. Wright and the Gifford Lectures will, in fact, devote an entire lecture to the question of what is history with respect to natural theology, because if you study... If you look into New Testament studies, this becomes a huge debate during the Enlightenment. To what degree can we rely on the canonical, uh, the canonical records, the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, with respect to its capacity to tell us about history? And this has been a very big issue in terms of the law, the ongoing conversation since the Enlightenment as to are these biblical sources reliable? If so, how much and for what? Now, in looking around and listening, so I re-listened to Matt Dillahunty's conversation with Jordan Peterson, and then Dillahunty keeps saying, if you just Google um, the superiority of, basically the superiority of objective morality or the superiority of secular morality, um, Delhunty keeps saying, well, I'll I'll explain it, and I can explain it. And even the conversation with Peterson, he said, you know, I'll, in my other video, I explain it to you. So I thought, well, I'll look up this video, and I'll listen to it. And I actually found this video very helpful. Now, the quality of this video is not very good. It looks like someone made it on a cell phone. It's interesting that Delahunty is speaking under a cross, which is up on the wall. But let's listen to what he has to say, because I think this is very helpful to the conversation. When we're, when we're assessing an action, and, and I do believe that this applies only to actions. Now pay attention, we've been talking about nouns and verbs, and says when we're assessing an action, we're talking about morality here, we're talking about action. And again, we're back to these two ways of looking at reality that Peterson leads uh, maps of meaning off in terms of reality as a space of objects and reality as a form for action. And when we're talking about morality, we're talking about action. We're talking about decisions. And as we're going to see, we're talking about hierarchies. Uh, the thought police can come pull me on the side afterwards. But the, the determination of whether something is moral or immoral is based on evaluating an action with respect to some standard or value. The determination, it's kind of hard to hear because the recording isn't very good, but the determination of morality is how it stands up with respect to some um, standard of morality or value. So here value and morality are, are used pretty interchangeably, which I agree with, and that's fair. There's a standard, and so when we listen to Sam Harris talk about, talk with Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris almost always implicitly has a standard. All of us come to these conversations with our own standards. 
Now then the question is, well, how can we evaluate these standards? How can we evaluate these standards one to another? What's the best system for doing so? Dillahunty and I are on the same page here. Um, if we're going to evaluate something, there needs to be a standard. We do that implicitly or we do it explicitly. Positive evaluations that are labeled morally good, morally right, and negative evaluations are labeled as evil or wrong. Uh, morally neutral assessments uh, may be truly neutral uh, or simply so complex or subjective that a clear evaluation may not be possible. It makes no difference, though, whether the standard by which you measure is ultimately the source of a subjective opinion or an objective truth. Once you have the standard, the assessment with respect to that standard becomes objective. Uh, that's an interesting move, that, that once you have a standard, the assessment of the action with respect to the standard becomes objective. Okay, in, objective in terms of if I say something and it's recorded in print or it's recorded in, in a recording or something like that, it becomes objective. All right, I'll, I'll go with you. There's a lot of bickering uh, about objective morality versus subjective morality, moral relativism, moral absolutes, um, and I probably won't get into too much of that today. The point is that if you can agree on a standard, you can make an objective assessment. The standard itself may be subjective. Also. We can assess. So the standard may be subjective, but you make an objective. Once you make an assessment, you create something objective. And actually, in a little portion of the Dillahunty-Peterson conversation, Dillahunty goes here and, and basically says it could be life is better than death. It could be, you know, a variety of these standards. I'm not going to, Peterson keeps wanting to say, you need to ground your standard. And Dillahunty keeps saying, I don't really need to ground the standard. It's, it's good enough that we have this standard, but then our evaluation to that standard, we'll call that objective. Okay. Assess any, any action with respect to any standard or value. Um, and consider chess for a moment. It's a game with rules, and those rules might have been the result of careful thought, it could have been the result of playtesting, years of evolving gameplay, or they could have been just arbitrarily thought of. Okay, so he's going to use the example of chess, and this is going to be a very helpful illustration saying it doesn't matter how chess evolved, whether how many squares there are on the board, whether they're red and white, or whether they're black and white, or, or exactly what the matrix is. It doesn't matter the shape of the, of the characters. None of that really matters, whether it was you know, kind of developed over a long time, or if some brilliant person just kind of thought of it and dreamed it up, or, or whether we've tinkered with it. Whatever it is, it's there, and we'll, we'll just leave it there. Here's the rules, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to play. But, irrespective of how those rules came about, we can assess each player's moves with respect to those rules. Okay, we can assess each player's moves with respect to the rules. No matter how the rules came up, the rules themselves provide a standard. And if you move a piece in a way that is not in keeping with the rules, well, you've broken the game. Okay, the game only works if you keep it with respect to the rules, and you can assess each move with respect to the rules, and then in a minute we're going to get to... The rules of chess aren't directly analogous to morals. They're rigid, they're externally imposed, but the creation of the game is somewhat analogous. And the strategy that one uses to play the game is what we're really talking about when we talk about moral systems. Moral systems are a strategy to play the game. Okay? And again, if you go back to where we were here, we have reason from above, we have empiricism down below, we have the past. The one thing we don't have very well is the future. And that's part of the reason this keeps, Peterson keeps bringing the future into it and sacrifice. Because this is a real problem when it comes to meaning. Because our telos, our ends, our future, our purpose, our goals, I should just, we, we need those goals. In other words, morality sort of like the game of chess, is we can evaluate things based on whether they get us closer to the goal. Would it be fair to say that the strategy one uses in chess is subjective? Sure. 
The strategy one uses in chess is subjective. But as long as the goal is to win the game. But as long as the goal is to win the game, or to avoid losing at a minimum, we're able to evaluate the strategy, which is we're able to evaluate the strategy, which is subjective and individualized, with respect to that goal of winning the game. With respect to that goal of winning the game. Now, obviously, if you've played chess, you understand what the goal of winning the game is. It's to capture the king. It's a very specific goal. It's a very concrete goal. It's because you understand the world of the game, you understand the goal. Now, there can be many other goals around chess. Playing chess could be a could be a strategy to get at another goal. If you're a world-class chess player, it could be to gain fame, to gain status, to gain money, to whatever. But within the realm of the game, the goal is simple. It would be dishonest to imply that because different people have different strategies that we are, as a collective, somehow unable to say anything about which strategy is superior. So you can evaluate the superiority or inferiority of a strategy with respect to how the goal works. And here in his slide he says, a moral system is a strategy to achieve goals consistent with the standard. Okay, I'm in agreement. We judge a strategy by its results. Comparing its results to the goal. We judge a strategy by its results, comparing its results to the goal. I'm in agreement. That's now he's going to get into the superior, how, how secularist morality is superior to religious morality. That's right. We can identify actions that are better or worse, even if we're unable to identify absolutes or clearly define the best move. We can identify actions which are better and worse, even if we're unable to... Now, listen to this again. Even if we're unable to identify absolutes or clearly define the best move. Unable to define absolutes or clearly define the best move. Okay. So, in other words, we might not know what the perfect move is, but we can say there's a better or worse move. Again, I'm with him. In a game of chess, there are a number of options, and some are clearly better than others. Just as we can identify that, generally speaking, if our goal is to make friends with somebody, it's probably, you're more likely to succeed by offering them a gift than you are by stealing their car. Those are extremes, and we can easily identify the extremes. Everybody can do it. It's trivial. It's one of the reasons why the subject of morality is so muddy, because there are things that are patently obvious to everybody, and nobody understands why. Or almost nobody understands why. Or maybe, maybe we're not even sure who understands why. We can argue about it. But we can identify those extremes, and people who are uncomfortable with the things in between the, stream, the extremes, the, the spectrum of, of possible actions that we take, some people want to appeal to external authorities. And okay, so there's strategies involved, and people are uncomfortable with some of the strategies pursued, and so what they want to do is appeal to external authorities. And that would be, let's say you're playing a game of chess with someone, and someone makes a move, and someone says, well, I don't think that's a really good move. And so you start to have a conversation about the move that you made. And one person says, I don't think it's a very good move because I can see this is going to put you in a worse position. You might lose this pawn, or you might lose this bishop, or you might even lose your queen. But the other person says, ah, no. But in books such and such, authority so-and-so says that this is a better move. Therefore, it's a better move. And Delahunty is essentially saying, that is what religion is. Okay, we'll talk more about that. Those external authorities tend to oversimplify the options. There's a broad range of possibilities between offering a gift and stealing somebody's car, and the test of the strategy is in determining how accurately and efficiently it assists you in placing actions within that spectrum. Okay, towards the goal. That's critical here, that morality is goal-oriented in Dillahunty's framework. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Morality is goal-oriented, but you're going to have a real difficult time getting at the question, what is the goal? How does your system of morality, how effective is it at figuring out how good something is or how bad something is? It's something Listen to this again, but now he's not saying towards the goal. 
That's implicit here. He's already said it. But without that towards the goal, you, in a sense, elevate morality to kind of float out there on its own. And that's how we use, we say, well, that's moral or that's immoral. But the question is always, towards what goal? So let's listen to that again. How does your system of morality, how effective is it at figuring out how good something is or how bad something is? It's, you know, what process goes through the comparison to determine those goals? Ah, ah, see, right there he slipped. To determine those goals, and then he corrects himself. What process goes through the comparison to determine those goals? Or how, how results meet those goals? How the results, he corrects himself. But that slip, I think, is important because this is what we do as human beings. We change the goals. We change the goals, and this is, this is ad hoc reasoning. It's the definition of it. And it's what the rider does on the elephant. We say, I want to be the best, I want to be the best ball player in the world. And baseball isn't working out so good, so I switched to basketball. And he said, Yeah, see, I wanted to be the best basketball player in the world. But you said ball player. Yeah, but I meant basketball. We we have funny relationship with the goal. And and really the questions we have here is how are we to know the goals? Now, Dillahunty and Sam Harris will both appeal to well-being. That well-being is the goal. And we're going to have to look at that. One advantage of secular morality is that we can assess any strategy on its own merits, and we can use those obvious extremes as a guideline to help filter the scenarios that are less obvious. Okay, let's hear that again. One of the advantages of secular morality is we, we can assess any any well let's hear it's obvious that we can assess any strategy on its own merits and we can use those obvious extremes as a guideline to help filter the scenarios that are less obvious so you're going to use obvious extremes to help filter less obvious extremes now this is essentially plato's argument in the republic where plato says you know we're trying to figure out what is justice we're, we're dealing with the same thing that plato was dealing with and so in, his, in, in, that, in the Republic, which is a dialogue with Socrates and a bunch of other individuals, and Socrates says, we want to know what justice is. And, well, it's hard to see in a human being, so we blow the human being up to the city because a man is to the city or a woman is to the city. I'm not making a sex or a gender argument here, but it's, it's to the city. And so we blow it up. And now there's a, there's a lot implicit in Plato's observation there, but it's very important because not only do we reflect the kiwitas, the culture, the civilization we are in, but we expand to it and we live towards it. So there's that direction is going in both ways. And so now Dillahunty says we use extreme examples to illuminate difficult examples. And then always, obviously the debate is always, does this illustration actually illuminate or not? Because some illustrations illuminate better, but some illustrations don't. But remember, all of this is framed within a goal, all right? And they're going to say that the goal is well-being. Now, where Dillahunty is going to go, well, let's just hear where he goes. It's much the same way we do in science and, and, and disciplines where we have this amassed human knowledge. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. We can benefit from the wisdom of the people who came before us. Similarly, he loves that shoulders of giants phrase. We, we can compare extremes. We do it all the time. Uh, well, this isn't bad, but, you know, it, would, could it be bad? Or could it be worse? Uh, you know, we, we have slippery slope arguments where, well, if you, you know, if you legalize marijuana next, you'll have to legalize crack. No, you don't. That's absurd. But why do they go to that every time? It's because it's obvious to everybody, or almost everybody, that legalizing crack is probably a really bad thing. And they're using it to misrepresent in this oversimplification that I was talking about the legalization of marijuana, which, by the way, I'm in favor of and not in smoke. <coughs> and then he coughs and everyone laughs. <laughs> is there something there I missed? He didn't notice that he coughed because we don't notice ourselves very well, but everyone in the room mentioned how he just talked about marijuana and that he smoked and then he coughed and everybody laughed because, oh, well, what's your goal? Getting high or avoiding smoking so that maybe your lungs are in better shape? Depends on what your goal is. <laughs> 
So I'd like to address some of the aspects of moral strategy by contrasting secular moral systems with, uh, oh, see, that's a slide, I'm focused on this. <laughs> uh, by contrasting secular moral systems with non-secular moral systems by considering what is the origin of the core values and the goals in each system? Whose interests are served? So what is the origin of the core core, value, of, uh, core values in those systems? Who inter whose interests are served? How does each system handle the issues of justification and authority? What does each system address the need for modifications to, to the values and goals? What process does each use for resolving conflicts about values? And how robust or flexible is each system? Now, now he and Sam Harris seem to very much be on the same page with a lot of this stuff. It's not identical, and I suppose in a purely rational world, we would want them to be identical, but they're not. And again, don't forget, way out here, we've got this question of goals lingering, because that's actually going to be where, that's your orientation. That's your North Star. That's, that's you know, if you're trying to orient in the woods, you look at a far distant mountain and you look at a closer tree and you say well and orienting myself towards that mountain is that's where I want to go but I've got the tree here so I'm going to go to this tree and then at that tree I'm going to look at the mountain again then I'm going to look for another closer one and that's that's how I'm going to orient but the goal here is what gives the overall orientation and the the evaluation of the morality, which are the choices, depends completely on the goal. You guys are going to quickly sense a trend, um, probably by the next slide. Yeah, you're not going to have to listen to the whole thing to understand what he's going to say and do. Imagine you were going to design a game system or government. You can get out of the games if you want, or, or I mean, tend to use games because we have things that even lifelike games where we try to mimic life and have second lives and things like that. But if you're going to design it, do you design it with the best interests of the participants in the mind? Is your goal to make a system that is profitable for you and note that profitability may be a direct result of making a system that is beneficial for the players? Um, is your goal to make a system um, that you participate in or is it a system for other people to participate in? Are you a member of the player set, or are you an external authority deciding what the players can do? Now, pay attention here because he's exactly right. Right away, you have the difference between a secular orientation and, let's say, a religious orientation. Because the secular orientation is what I call the, it's within the iron box of secularism. In Charles Taylor's terms, we're a buffered self, it's the imminent frame, and the goal is. Well, we want the well-being of the participants. Who's the participants? Us. Well, as I've said in a number of other videos, watch the first person plurals. Who's us? Well, who is us? Me and my loved ones. Me and the people I agree with. Me and my nation. Uh, human beings as opposed to others in the animal kingdom. Because, for example, if you look at, let's say, the food industrial complex, um, is the goal of that system the cow? Now, if you read Jared Diamond, he'll note that in an interesting way, cows have never done better than they've done now in terms of there's more cow DNA all over the world than there's ever been before. Is the goal corn? We've never grown more corn than we have have before. Is the goal wheat? We've never grown more wheat. Now, as opposed to bison, it's not been a good deal. They almost went extinct. Many other animals aren't around. We had a romantic connection to the bison, so we saved them. But corn, you know, look at the food industrial complex. But what's the goal of those of that complex? You might say, well, the cow has done dramatically well, given our rise, but the cow has been a hitchhiker, as has the dog, as has the cat, as have a select number of animals that we were able to domesticate. So what really is the goal? Well, the goal is us. Well, is the goal us? Or is the goal me? And me and mine, and me and my children, or me and my parents, or me and my church, or me and my tribe. Again, watch the first-person plurals, because we do a lot of smuggling under those first-person plurals. So the goal in a secular society is not anything 
supernatural, not anything, not any God, not anything outside the box. It's us. And Dillahunty says, that's superior. Well, I mean, there's a bias written all over that. And we might say, well, it hasn't been superior for the chimp. It hasn't been superior for the gorilla. It hasn't been superior for the uh, wild animals domesticated into the cow. It hasn't been superior for those other strains of corn that seed banks are hurriedly trying to sneak away and preserve lest they get contaminated by all of the stuff that we're doing in our farming industrial complex. Remember what he said initially. There's a standard. And he's using that standard. And the question is, okay, what's the goal? Well, he tells us the goal right away. And Sam Harris tells us the goal right away. The goal is us and our well-being. Now, if you look at, for example, Elon Musk's conversation with Joe Rogan, they're sitting there postulating, I wonder if we're just a bootloader for a cyber reality, the Borg. Well, then what's the goal? Is the goal the Borg? And, and right away that you see this, this goal of well-being doesn't, isn't sufficient, sufficiently specific or answer the question. And, and so where this goes then is, well, without a clear goal, well, we'll say the goal is our well-being. Okay, is that goal sufficiently clear? Because first of all, you have, to, you have to determine the first person plural. Well, who's us? Well, in, so we use extreme examples, just like Delante told us to. In Nazi Germany, that's an extreme example. What was the goal? Well, human race, that's us. That's a definition of us. Human race, we're in racial evolutionary terms. And so in order to achieve that goal, we're going to exterminate the Jews and the Slavs and people with birth defects and all of those things. It's, it's a eugenic it's a eugenic goal. We're going to improve the race. It's a racial goal. That's the goal. That's a humanist goal. If you look back in the other video, I also mentioned the Soviet Union. Well, they had a social goal of material equality. Okay? That's well-being. So according to the Nazis, well-being is racial purity. That's our goal. It's a humanist goal. According to the Soviets, well-being is material equality. That's a humanist goal. It's our goal. And I think according to the Epicureans, as N.T. Wright, I think, correctly lays, we'll call them the progressive Epicureans. According to the progressive Epicureans, what we're looking for is maximal happiness equality. That's really, I think, the goal of our society right now. And if you listen to the social conversations and you listen carefully, because you're going to have to, you're going to have to discern the goal because we don't really have a clear goal. It's, it's not that firm. It's very large, very complex. It's very elastic, as Sam Harris says his well-being goal is. It's progressive maximal happiness equality that's what we're looking for and you can continue to listen to dill hunty he um no big surprises of where he goes and and it's a very good talk i you know i appreciated it but now we get to piaget and jordan peterson and their equilibrated state because this is where in a sense the well-being really begins to struggle is it well-being for me is it well-being for me and mine? Is it well-being for me and my children and grandchildren? Or well-being in terms of however I conceive of my identity family system? How about my neighbors? How about my friends? How about my thought tribe? How about my city? How about my state? And actually, this isn't just two axes. These axes go out all the way, all the way out to the human race and all of history. And, you know, I'm doing an everything shield here, just like Sam Harris. Everything you can conceive of. And what Sam Harris is going to want to say is, well-being at every dimension. Oh, good. Well, that's, you know, yeah, that's, we're looking for the best. And we can use superlatives like that. Language has that capacity. But 
if we're going to want to get specific and if we're going to want to be able to discriminate and differentiate, which is what morality is about, this is better than this. That is better than that. We're going to have to figure this out. Now, Sam Harris basically says we can do this on the fly. And whoops, this gets into this question of orientation and well-being, which is a good a bit from Vancouver, too. Been good. So let me let me ask you a question here about well-being because this is something I've wanted to ask you about, but we never seem to get to. Okay. Is so you think that we should maximize well-being, and that's part of your proposition, which which I don't entirely disagree with, by the way, that we should ground our value structures in facts. Okay. So maximize well-being. Who who could be against that? Grounded in facts. Sam Harris certainly wants to be. None of us want to be, you know. None of us want to be factless in this business. But, but, but there's a black box problem there, like I think the black box problem about the a priori structure that we use to extract the facts of the world out. And, and again, a black box problem is that we're using a word here, and this, this thing is doing work for us, but the box isn't transparent to us. We don't, we don't really understand the processes, or if you're Jordan Peterson, the processes of, of finding out what's actually going on in that black box. And the, the black box problem is, if we could measure well-being, it's like, yeah, that's a big problem, Sam. Like, we have measures of well-being, and they're terrible. Yeah. Like, if you, yes, oh, yeah. they are. If no, you no, take, no, 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 I'm agreeing. I, I, don't oh, think, okay. I don't think it's, but it's not a problem for my thesis. It's, it, we don't have well, measures for anything we care about, really. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you're... If you're it might not be a problem for your thesis, but it certainly is a problem for the application of your thesis. Your thesis is that if we had the measures of well-being that were appropriate, we could use them in a positive way, and the response is, but we don't have those measures. It's like, well, okay, well, then what do we do? Oh, no, no, we, we have, but we have measures. I mean, this conversation is a measure. I don't like that. That's a measure. Right? You step on my toe and I say, ow. That's a measure. Don't do that again. But that's not a measure of your well-being. It might be a measure of your trait neuroticism. Well, it, it's, a me, it's a measure of... And, but I mean that... These, I mean are, that, these are non-points. No, no, but I mean, this be, yeah. I mean this... Harris was a little concerned about his status when someone whooped in the crowd and said, these are non-points. That's, that's the easiest... That's the easiest way to get... That's a non-question. Oh, okay. Technically, yes. if you look at the well-being measures that we have, Yes. They degenerate it, into measures of neuroticism. No, no, that's we, all we, they are. we don't, we don't, but we don't have measures of certainty, of belief, of compassion, of joy, of I mean, any any of these conscious states. We have we have neural correlates of some of them, but we don't have. Well, we, there's no well, then how helmet use, I can put on you. So hold, hold on. Fact. And and Brett Weinstein is super helpful here. It's about them to orient ourselves in the world then. Because if they let them in, we're doing this all the time. You're, 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 if, You've if, got an instantaneous measure, though. You've got an instantaneous measure of well-being. We can all check with ourselves, see how we feel. But and it's possible to be wrong about that. Right. Always, sure. Okay. Always sure. wrong. Yes, well, um, but uh, it. So right away, remember, in a sense, in a sense, everyone is a is a captive. If they're playing by their internally coherent rules, everyone is a captive to their own philosophical system. Sam Harris's philosophical system imagines the world as a space of objects. And that space of objects is timeless. In other words, it's all in the moment. It's all in consciousness. And you can see the limitation of Sam's philosophical system right there. And Brett Weinstein nails him on it and says, it's instantaneous. It's in the moment. In any given moment, you can say, is this, is this to my well-being or not? And... And well, that's and all of us know those people like to say live in the moment. And I'd say I see a lot of people who live in the moment. A lot of people who live in the moment make really bad decisions. It's called an impulse purchase. That car looks nice. I'll buy it. Well, did you actually think about whether you need a car or another car or your credit is sufficient or that actually lines up in terms of your hierarchy of values, whether 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 that's a good idea but in the moment there's well-being and and so Weinstein nails him and says this is momentary it degrades as you get away from the individual's ability to check internally 
And it's also individualistic, as is the monarchical vision that this timeless, sterile state that Sam Harris says, well, this is fundamentally what the world is. Well, it's timeless, it's sterile, it's also individualistic because even Matt Dillahunty and Sam Harris, well, they might agree on many things, but they can't agree on everything, which which reveals the limits. Let's Let's give them their system, but it reveals the limits of our capacity to apply it which is exactly where Jordan Peterson challenged him at this moment on. on the well, even hand, the, internal, the internal thing isn't reliable. It's because not lots reliable of times you're happy when you're doing things well, that are terrible sure, and for you yourself. You could take a drug that would make you feel very good and would cause you to take apart your own life because it would You mean remove... like cocaine? Right. It would... Peterson always brings up cocaine. <laughs> it would destroy the, the motivational structure that gets you to do stump, stuff of value that... Uh, that you're right. So we can't use emotion, moment right. to moment emotion, as an indicator. Right. Of well, the instantaneous is true. not good. But no. you have a parallel problem. It looks to me like the exact mirror image, which is that you've got a, an integrative, long-term measure of well-being instantiated in an evolutionary belief system, but it's coming apart because we are. Li okay, it's coming apart. It's always coming apart. It's that's the age of decay. Things are always coming apart, and. and this is, in a sense, Weinstein's big point, is that our, our traditional systems are no longer working. Now, when we get into C.S. Lewis, the, abolitions of man, the abolition of man, some Christians are going to have some, and Christians have for a long time, raised some objections to C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, because of the relationship between the Tao and the Christian conception of God. And I'm going to argue that they're not identical in that book. But Weinstein's point here is that, well, these systems were based for other environments and now we're in a new environment. And he and Peterson have their own difference of opinion on how different is the environment because Peterson will say, well, we are actually, our more basic orientation is good and evil, which Peterson said is a, re is a religious orientation, and chaos and order. And those are the more basic things and our, our brains are built for that with the two hemispheres. And, and this is what we're this is what we're working out. Living in circumstances that are less well mirrored, uh, the, the present does not mirror the past, and therefore these yeah. truths which you, you believe are timeless mm -hmm. are degrading yeah. rapidly. That's part of their, that's exactly right, yes. Okay, so what Sam is arguing is that the tools to pivot in order to improve our way of interacting, those are not the tools of long-standing tradition, those are the tools of rational engagement. Respect for that process is part of the long-standing tradition. Bingo. Respect for the process of rational engagement is part of the long-standing tradition, which is why I'm talking about Plato and Socrates. It's why we're going to talk beyond the Christian frame when we talk about abolition of man. And if any, if any of C.S. Lewis's books he goes into and respects other religious traditions, it's in his book, The Abolition of Man. But we're going to understand that and my argument that why this is not a non-Christian book and how Christians can participate in conversations about morality with non-Christians, with even non-Christians from varying traditions, and why we can do this productively. In fact, we have to do this productively is, is because, just like Peterson said, I'll play it again, of rational engagement. Respect for that process is part of the long-standing tradition. And he's dead on right. Now, Sam isn't want to, going to want to give him that point. Peterson is dead on right there. Yes, that's true. Yeah, but, but that's a big truth, man. I agree. That's a major league truth. I, I agree. And in fact, I would say the fundamental tradition, the most fundamental tradition of the West, <laughs> says that respect for the process that updates moral judgment is the highest of all possible values. There's the logos. That's Peterson's definition of the logos. And that's also built into the tradition, strangely enough. And... So, so he's sneaking, he's smuggling Jesus again, because that's what he says the Logos is. And when you say that, you know, Jesus judges the world, and Jesus becomes the standard by which everyone and everything in the world is judged, and this is, in, in a sense, the assertion of the New Testament, that the Logos, Jesus, is the judge of the world. Now, you might say, well... When you say it that way, I have a problem with it. Well, I understand that. And that's differences in terms of religion. But pay attention. When Christians say Jesus, Jesus returns, Apostles' Creed, um, come to judge the living and the dead. 
that's a representation of that same idea that all things will be judged and i would i would argue that that assertion that all things will be judged is implicit it's deeply foundational to the idea of morality and gets practiced in this question of the debate about the communist states and the nazi states whether or not god was watching which they'll get into with douglas murray in the next debates but the idea behind morality is that there is a judgment and there somehow will be a judge and i think that's deeply within it even though often we try to skim the top and take it away from that but i i, I think almost anyone who employs these terms takes from that foundation and relies upon it and i know there's going to be some of you in the comment section that hear this and say whoa but i and this again is, is sort of like the ontological argument in that it might not be convincing but it's really really hard to dispel when 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 you call someone out and say well let's say you know there's just a new york times i'm going to mention donald trump that'll get more comments uh new york times piece about donald trump cheating on his taxes okay let's say donald trump never gets caught never gets fined statue of limitations has passed he got away with it and, and delante deals with this argument implicit even in naming that he got away with it is a, a haunted nagging angst of judgment that that somehow this is implicit in this hindu idea of karma somehow the universe is just that's an article of faith now we're getting back into the goal area here i agree it's built into the, into the tradition but i would argue that it is very likely to be compartmentalized in other words i was a little bit struck when you said that um what did you say about scaling you said that uh, these, well, well, I mean, the, good reasons scale and bad reasons don't. Isn't that the opposite of the truth? <laughs> no. No, if, you're calling, if you're calling these well, stories it, it, that give prescriptions for how to behave bad ideas, the point is those stories propagate very easily. Well, so whereas, so if we want to talk about the gun and whether it is loaded, mm -hmm. the idea that the gun is definitely loaded, that scales really easily, right? You can pass that along and show someone a gun and say it's loaded chances are they're unless they have evidence they're not going to say eh, i don't think so we're biased to assume it is one sentence yeah. and, and the, conse the consequence on the consequences other of being hand, wrong about a loaded gun also scale right so no no well, no, they, no no well, if they you should. want to talk to people about very small possibilities of very dire things happening they trip over it it's a hard thing to get it's almost impossible for children right. to get it so the point is, the one thing does scale, a story that says, yeah, every gun is loaded. It's a false story, but that one definitely scales. Yeah. And, and Weinstein makes an excellent argument here in terms of human psychology. Think about vaccinations. If you live in a place where measles runs rampant, folks are going to get their kids vaccinated in a New York minute. If you live in a context when you don't know anybody who has measles and you never hear about measles and measles isn't a threat in terms of now this gets into how well our conscious minds discern threats versus experience that the rest of our mind is having. If the rest of our mind isn't experiencing the threat, well, we don't get our kids vaccinated unless there is a structure, law and they passed a law in California that says you must get your kid vaccinated if they want to go to school. And, you know, Sam Harris would argue, I think rightly so, this is rationality, but this is what he's bumping into. The statistical reality of guns and the fact that they may indeed be unloaded, but you don't want to play around with the remote possibility that one day you'll get it wrong, right? That doesn't scale because it requires you to have experience with stuff that is not common. Right. Well, so, so there are two things here. Okay. So now we have the question, what is, you know, how does this work? Um, this objective morality. Del Hunty says, now there's a goal out there. 
And the game of chess, there's a goal. That's capturing the king. That's the goal. And, and things are, I would argue, things are rational. And uh, Sam Harris uses the word this word the same way. I'm sure Dillahunty would. Things are rational depending on how they orient towards the goal. Now, again, we just had this conversation about well-being. And Sam Harris's definition of well-being is very individual and it lives in the moment. Jordan Peterson's got a lot better sense of it because he's going back in history. And if we go back to the slide, oops, no, 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 but, no, no. If we go back to this slide, Peterson is saying, I want to get orientation. He's going to use reason, he's a very reasonable guy. He's going to use experience, going to use data, going to use empiricism, going to use the past, the record, and kind of use reason to, to get at history in the past. It's, it's there in the middle. But again, we've kind of got goals hanging out there. And, and what Peterson is, in a sense, trying to do is use these three, use these three sides of the rectangle to get the fourth. All right? And, and so what he's, he's, he's measuring, he's saying this, he's saying, we can, we can almost see the fourth side of the rectangle, which is the goals, which is the future, which is the telos, which is the reason, the purpose. And, and the reason Peterson is using mythos and mythology and story and religion is because that, as I mentioned in the last one, stories have beginning and endings. Stories have natural arcs. And, and Peterson is trying to get to this fourth side of the rectangle so that he can, he can basically complete it. But now, how to do that? We've already seen that Sam Harris has an orientation problem because it tends to be right there in the middle. I am judging morality, and Dillahunty has a similar one. And they, I don't think they sufficiently take into account Peterson's point that in any one of our lives, we have a serious problem we have a serious time problem and that's why peterson has his a priori structure that has been built for millions of years that has developed the cultural element the soft part of it has developed for thousands of years and it's been represented and embodied in stories in drama in actions it's been seen by poets it's been discussed and chewed on again and again and if you don't believe the bible's been chewed on this is this is all chewing of the Bible behind me here. That's that's what this whole thing is. And we're working and we're working and we're working and we're working on it. And we're trying to orient ourselves and get the best picture we can. And and now there's a bias at play here. Sam Harris wants to say, right now we know enough where you and I, on the basis of our momentary decisions, can make a decision. And again, as I mentioned in my conversation with with uh, William Lee that I posted yesterday. Well, let's say Sam's talking to his wife and they say, should we buy another car? Do we need a new car? Well, they're gonna employ a whole lot of rationality for it, but that just streams out into the world. One of the questions might be, should we get an electric car? Well, why should we get an electric car? Well, maybe because we're concerned about CO2. Okay, you just streamed out into the world on how many layers, and Peterson is right, it's all built in and it's so implicit and simplified and compacted into a conversation that one of the implicit things that C.S. Lewis is going to get to is, do we care about the world we leave our children and our children's children? Well, what makes you care that? Well, if, if an SUV gives you more well-being now, why should you care about the future? Well, that's a complicated conversation. One person called me and we had a conversation about CO2 and he didn't think CO2 was that big of a deal and, you know, therefore everything's going to be fine. Okay, that's part of the conversation. Others say CO2 is a very big deal. You'd be better off buying an electric car. Other people are going to come and say, yeah, but what about the... The, the manufacturing of all the components and the cost of the world on those things and so on and so forth, batteries versus gasoline. I mean, these conversations go forever, but there's so much stuff implicit in this. And Peterson's point is, we don't simply have time when we're making the decision 
do I buy an electric car or a gasoline car, that all we use is, is heuristics and shortcuts and we make a decision in the moment. And well, well, what goes into that moment? Well, our intuitions, the elephant, this massive parallel processing thing that is most of the rest of our brain says, I just feel better about an electric car. And the other person says, I feel better about an SUV. And what they're not saying is that maybe a family member died in a small car accident in the past. So now built into them, they have a feeling about, I just feel more comfortable in a big car. That whole history gets shortcutted into a heuristic and it gets loaded into a feeling. And well, this is the stock and trade of psychologists that they try to sometimes unpack those feelings and expose them to rationality and say, sometimes small cars can be safe too. Someone says, I just have a feeling I like an SUV, a big SUV better. Why do you have that feeling? Let's unpack that. Slowly pull it apart. That's what psychologists do. But now, how can we as a group figure out what's best? Wrong, but... Uh, the reality is, is we're navigating in this space and morality and ethics are, are the terms we use for how we think about our behavior affecting one another's experience. So if you're in a moral solitude, if you're on a desert island or if you're, you know, on a, uh, alone in the... Now, this is a very interesting example. ...universe, morality is not the issue you need to worry about, but well-being still is an ever-present issue. It so now we have the question of goals and we have the question of gods because if you go back to peterson at the lafayette lecture he says the axioms implicit in it well these axioms have been built into you your ability to calibrate well-being is built into you now you're stuck on a desert island and you can look at there's you let's look at wilson and tom hanks in in castaway so you're on a well-being, you're, you're on a desert island. What is going to determine your well-being? Well, probably a lot of where you've been raised and what you're used to. Um, where you're going to sleep, what kind of structure you're going to build, what your priorities of what are some of the first things you're going to build, one of the first things you're going to devote your time to. Now, if you've never been a castaway and you don't know anything about survival, you're probably going to get a whole bunch of things wrong. But if you were raised in a society that was well accustomed to the kind of island that you were that you are now trapped on or the kind of wilderness that you're isolated in, you're going to have different tools. In other words, there's generations of things built into that. And now let's say you were raised in northwestern Europe and you have a great capacity to digest dairy that's been built into you from generations in the past and you're isolated on an island with a cow. It's you and the cow and maybe a few cows. And some of these cows have given birth to young and they're, they're semi-tame so you can milk them. Well, now the, the genetics that you bring to the island are very helpful in terms of whether or not you're lactose intolerant. That's been built in by a not very distant history. And then there's all of these variables. And, and so now Sam wants to say, well, you know, morality isn't really at playing, but well-being is at playing. It's like, okay. And, and this gets into the question of the good in terms of the context of the whole. And not just the social, but the picture of the whole thing, which is going to be in into Jordan Peterson's God One. It's possible to suffer and it's possible to, to experience bliss and, and some, perhaps something beyond that. And so maybe if you were stuck on the island with cocaine. And we, the horizon in both directions is something we you know, will we'll never fully explore, explore very likely. I mean, okay. we, we don't know how good things can get and we don't know how bad they can get, but, but that there's a spectrum here is undeniable. And I, I would say that, that my moral realism simply entails that we acknowledge that it's possible not to know what you're missing. Is moral realism, okay? Again, someone in the comment section said, well, 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 Sam Harris isn't about the ob objective moral value. I think that's pretty much an equivalent statement for him. He says, there's a moral reality built into the world 
because it's an objective world and well-being is our calibration system in order to pursue, well, then what is morality? Well, morality is achieving that goal of well-being. But again, we're asking the question, is well-being a differentiated and specific enough idea to serve as a goal? And this is going to become problematic and exposed to be problematic as we get into the abolition of man because and if you're already reading the abolition of man you've seen it already and it's a very short book or it's a very short audiobook it's just three chapters you can get through it in three hours well-being according to what whose well-being my well-being according to what criteria see i would assert that religion is all about getting specific about the goal Okay, and and that's something that this rectangle that, okay, we have three sides. We have the past, we have the earth below, empiricism, we have rationality on top, but we don't have the goal, the telos, the future, the outcome. In order for the story to be complete, we need the ending. And this, again, I think is partly why we're so, stories are so powerful to us because stories are the complete rectangle. They have the ending built in most of the time or at least they point us to the ending it's possible to be living in a way where you are less happy than you could be and not to know why right and to just not have the wisdom to make the changes and that matters if anything matters that matters uh uh if anything that does matter but i wouldn't say that's and this again sam harris in a sense exposes his god he's saying that's the ultimate of what matters that's the goal the goal is being happy. And so you would say, well, happiness is the goal. And you'd say, no, that's not enough. Everyone needs to be happy. So happiness equality. So progressive maximal happiness equality. That's our goal. That's progressive Epicureanism. I think that's pretty much what Sam is. And that's where the anti-right conversations are, are really helpful. And, and it matters to us individually and it matters to us collectively. See, happiness, equality. And that mattering is our, is the, subsumes everything we can intelligibly want. That mattering subsumes everything we can intelligibly want. This is the goal for Sam. Okay? This is his goal. And, and he's, he's just saying well-being, but I don't think well-being is getting at it. In this domain of value. And that's and so again, it's, it's the, the the cash value of any value claim is in the the actual or potential change in consciousness for some conscious system. For the goal, go back to Delahunty. That's how we can evaluate it towards the goal. Well, what's your goal? Well, it's well-being. Well, it's happiness. Well, it's not just happiness for me. Happiness for more people. And okay, these words are also representations, and they're they're approximations absolutely somewhere sometime and that's that's my claim and that's can i can i try to get i would like you each to clarify something and again brett is a huge help in these talks so it sounds to me sam like you are hypothesizing that a rationalist approach will always beat a traditional metaphorical approach with respect to gender and jordan is praying <laughs> of well-being well, well not always but enough so th there's so many obvious you'd have to watch the video to see that is downsides to the traditional sectarian dogmatic approach that we should want to get out of the religion business as fast as possible okay so amen okay but as fast as i don't mean amen to what harris just said i've been mean amen because peterson just left his prayer possible but do you mean that it has always been true that we should always have gotten away from it as fast as possible or do you mean now we should get away from it as fast as possible but there is a point somewhere in the past where it might have been true that actually the best the most uh, the richest path to well-being might have been encoded metaphorically oh yeah that's, that's certainly possible and in, in fact you might even say it was likely based on the fact that we have all of these systems still around right? okay. Okay, so Sam is agreeing with Peterson here that in the past stuff was encoded metaphorically and this was helpful and helpful towards what again? Now remember, Sam's is um, and he's a he's a progressive Epicurean. And, so, but we but, still but, have the systems around in part because our 
like we still we still think in metaphor and we actually can't help it because uh, half of our brain is oriented towards metaphor but so so yeah the, these systems have built us and we're not going to get away from metaphor peterson says can, can i get you to clarify something now yes okay so <laughs> you have argued and you've actually quite surprised me by doing so you've argued that the dogmatism is a bug and not a feature You've argued. No, it's a bug and a feature. Okay, it's a bug and a feature. Good. So, yes. Um, but what, what I thought I heard you say was that the um, resistance to update yes. was uh, a problem, that effectively it was an obstacle. Yeah, so is lack of resistance to update. Okay. Now we're getting to the meat of it that resistance to update is a problem and lack of resistance to update is a problem. What does this mean? We, we're always orienting. And you want your orienting. If you've ever if you've ever used controls that have zero friction, you you know let's let's look at the um, you want to control the fan the knob that controls the fan speed on your car. Notice how they put resistance in that knob and they put clicks in that knob, little points. Now they don't have to. They could make that switch resistance free. And what you'd always be doing is all the way on and all the way off. And what you really need to do is click it up, click it up, click it up. It gives you more settings, okay? And so what Peterson is saying is that we're always having to reorient. And, and so resistance is a problem because sometimes it's hard to turn. Lack of resistance is a problem because then we're just flailing all over the place. And so in this enormously complex world, well, he'll say it in a minute. Right, okay, there's good. problems everywhere, man. Well, it's there's a tension. Okay. There is a tension. There's a tension. There's a terrible tension. Okay. Right, well, look at, look well, at but, it this way. Look at it this way. Most new ideas are stupid and dangerous. Yeah. But, but most but some old... of... Right there. Okay, now we're seeing everybody's bias. Peterson's saying most new ideas... Well, we'll say it again. And Harris jumps in. Now, again, when we get into abolition of man, Lewis is talking about traditional objective value. Lewis is, in a sense, on the right side of the stage, more of a conservative, saying, let's be careful. And Sam is over here saying, let's just go. Idea. There's a tension. There's a tension. There's a, okay, There's good. problems everywhere, man. Well, it's, there's a tension. Okay. There is a tension. There's a tension. There's a terrible tension. Okay. Right, well, look, at, look well, at, but, at it this way. Look at it this way. Most new ideas are stupid and dangerous. Yeah. But, but most but some old of them ideas are, vital. are as well. I mean, that's, but some of them are vital. Yeah. Right. And so we have we're screwed both ways. It's like, well, if we stay locked in our current mode of apprehension, all hell is going to break loose. If we generate a whole bunch of new solutions, most of them are going to be wrong and we're going to die. And so what we need to do is, and well, it, it, it's a Darwinian claim in some sense, is that yep. despite the fact uh, Brett Weinstein agrees. Yep, it is a Darwinian claim. Now, now, in terms of see Brett's big point that he keeps coming back to again and again is we're in a different environment. OK. But that's a, that's an argument that is also, that's an assertion that's also subject to evaluation because we're not sure how different it is. And again, we have this problem because we're these little short-lived creatures. And, and we even see this in scale. A person who is 17 years old and sees something says, wow, that's surprising. And a person who's 80 years old says, everything, everything old is new again. I see people learning the same thing over and over. That's because if they've lived 80 years and they've been watching carefully, they've been learning things all over and over again. Now, if you had a 180-year-old versus an 80-year-old, um, you'd have a different perspective. But we don't have 180-year-olds because we wear out and we die. So what do we do? We read history. We look to the past. And, and you say, well, that's not perfect because, no, it isn't perfect. But it's better than nothing. And, and so this is where you get the, the temperamental diversity of, of liberals and conservatives. Jonathan Haidt goes into that. Jordan Peterson goes into that. It's, part of that is built into us. It's in the hardware side. This diversity is built in, and this diversity is helpful, and talking is helpful. So we have liberals and conservatives talking because we're always trying to calibrate with one another and figure out, well, well, maybe we should be over here, or maybe we're over here, or where are we on the bubble? Well, we don't know. So we have to keep talking. The fact that most new ideas are stupid and dangerous, a subset of them are so vital that if we don't incorporate them, we're all going to perish. That's the bloody existential condition. And so now, and part of the issue here, and see, and I think that this is, 
the problem is, is that let's take the, the dogma idea. Okay, so there's... Because remember, when we started Vancouver 1, dogma is the big evil. And you get that from Bill Hunt. Dogma is a big evil. Dogma is a problem. we got to get rid of dogma. And Peterson's saying, whoa, first of all, you don't own the dogmas you have. Because when you say we've got to get rid of dogma, you've just established another one. Dogmas will always be with you. Secondly, you'd better figure out how you're going to evaluate dogma. And that's not so easy because you're living in the now. And if you have a philosophical system that prioritizes the now, you're going to make impulse purchases and you're going to buy cars. The dogma incorporated in the books, but I'm going to throw away the books because the dogma was there before the books. And, and so, okay, oh, these books, these books. Okay, so Harris says, or Peterson says, all right, get rid of the books because the, the books are representations of the dogmas. Okay, now get back to Neil Postman. Let's not lose Neil Postman. The world is very complex. Once they're in books, they are different than if they're not in books. So, so okay, Jordan, and he would agree with that point too. And then the question is, where was the dogma? And the answer was, the dogma was in the cultural practices but it, and, in, and in the agreement that people made with regards to those cultural practices, but it was also part and parcel of the intrapsychic structure that enables us to perceive the world as such. See, this is my argument why Jordan Peterson should be in church. Now, he might say, well, I've got sufficient reason not to go to church. Okay. But you've just basically made the argument about not only traditional ideas, but traditional practices. But again, we're, we're sussing this because churches are always changing and we're going to get into the, we're going to get into this in a moment, but let's go back a little bit. In, and in the agreement that people made with regards to those cultural practices, but it was also part and parcel of the intrapsychic structure that enables us to perceive the world as such. So in other words, this stuff gets built into us it's the it's the filter it's the a priori filter that allows us to see things out there and to immediately the elephant does this because it's a massive parallel computer the elephant does it immediately develops hierarchies when we go when we go and pick out fruit in the supermarket we look at some fruits and avoid others and and we do this this fast and it's the unconscious parts of our brain and it gets it gets expressed in this idea of want and we're going to get into augusta because it's our wants are deeper down than our shoulds and they've demonstrated this in this i've talked about this experiment before where they have people in one room and they say i'm going to give you a number in this room and you're supposed to go to this other room and you're supposed to tell them the number and they give them a number from four digits to nine digits and to, to keep that number in our head it's a random number we have to work kind of hard but what they don't tell the subjects of the experiment is that there's a table in the middle and in that table there are snacks and they're about to be offered a snack and you're offered a piece of cake or you're offered a healthy snack so within the cultural framework of what is healthy because that's also in that experiment a piece of cake is supposed to be an unhealthy self-indulgent snack and a piece of fruit is supposed to be a healthy justifiable moral snack and what they discovered is that the people holding the big numbers pick the unhealthy immoral in terms of the goal of healthy living the immoral snack and the people who pick the moral snack have the small number because they can manage it and that's where we're at with this that we're our wants are more powerful than our shoulds, which is what Paul writes about in Romans 7. Now, the problem is, and I think this is the central place where we need to flesh out these ideas, is that you cannot view the world without an a priori structure. And that a priori structure has a dogmatic element. And so you can't just say, well, let's get rid of the dogma, because you well, can't perceive the world without it, a structure. It, it, you need a dogma. You'll always have a dogma. The dogma is built into your structure has an uninspected element yes it's unexpected but upon what basis will you inspect it and and again this this gets into well i can step back and inspect it yes to a degree you can but you are also the inspector and all of that stuff is built into it and this capacity which we have with consciousness to try to separate ourselves from ourselves and and do a moral evaluation of ourselves and inspect ourselves we have that capacity, but here's the thing. Another person has some advantages in inspecting us that we don't have in inspecting ourselves. 
there are some advantages we have in inspecting ourselves that the other person doesn't have. And this is a huge problem and it scales out and it's very difficult. I mean, so if you're talking about just you know, perceiving the world, yes, we have it. We have perceptual structure that allows for us to perceive the world. And we know that there are failure states, right? So we know, we know, for instance, that we are, we are, we've evolved to perceive, you know, in visual space. And now Peterson has to sit back and relax because actually Harris is not going to engage Peterson's point. And I really understand if he gets it. I don't know. I don't know. So what is religion? Religion is the longest continual conversation we've had about goals. It's in religion that we finish the rectangle. Against Sam Harris and, and Matt Delahunty, it's always being updated. They keep wanting to say that religion gets trapped in a book and there you have it. But what you don't understand is that that is all modulated within the spectrum, the community of religions. Okay, And even, for example, within my own tradition, the Reformed tradition, you have the Bible, which you don't change. And then on top of that, you have confessions, which you rarely change. And on top of that, now in the CRC, we have these uh, contemporary testimonies that you can change more often. And on top of that, you have your ideas and you actually have within yourself layered variability of updatable dogmas. And, and Peterson gets into this a little bit too. Everyone who reads the Bible, they might be reading the same text, but they're bringing different things to it. So there's all this variation built into it. And, and in that sense, some of those who say, well, I just read the text, they're being simplistic. You're bringing your baggage to the text. Now, you might freak out the other way and say, well, then what can we know? Well, no, that's not true, too. You can know some things. We're, we're in the middle. We're in this play. And, and religions change all the time. And as Peterson said, Christianity has that built into it. When on Judgment Day in Christianity, unlike a lot of things. In, in fact, when you open the books, you've got the Book of Life. Well, what's in the Book of Life? Well, it's names. It isn't rules. Say, well, here are the rules. What have you done? Well, there's some of that to the idea, but it's not just that. Because the, all of this variability has always been built into religion. So this is the longest continual conversation we've had about goals. All right. That's the key here. Because it's very hard to get goals from the other three sides of the rectangle. Religions modulate the pace of change with variable dogmatisms. You can see this in Protestantism. And, and in a sense, what, what happened in Protestantism, whereas within Roman Catholicism, you had all of that variability built within a formal structure, institutional structure, in Protestantism, those structures were more out in the wild to sort of be played on. Now, in any Roman Catholic will know, you go to a certain parish and you'll have a priest with their biases, and then you'll have a bishop and you'll have cardinals. And, and so all of those structures, that, that stuff is always being worked on institutionally within a Roman Catholic context. In a Protestant context, it's a little bit different, but you have some highly... So some groups with very little resistance to change, and those right now tend to be mostly the mainline churches, or or even some churches that, you know, they want to be spiritual but not religious. That anything that spirituality then becomes their filter. You have other far more dogmatic traditions. Let's look at the Amish on another extreme, where you know you're not using electric lights and you keep the phone in the barn and you use a horse and buggy and you don't use cars and 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 what you what all of these religions afford us is the chance to take a look at how many different experiments in real time now peterson makes the point that we do that with our imaginations all the time because it's better for our ideas to die than our body to die because our body is more is more real, more durable than the ideas. And, and we're going to get into this, this, this multivariable, this multivariable schema by which we can try to discern what's most real. Okay? So it's better that our ideas die than our body dies. And that's a good thing. Well, what happens with religion, and I think this is part of the reason that 
freedom of religion has won the day as in, and is embraced, sometimes with difficulty, by even the most dogmatic groups in America is because we've been able to see that religions actually do better if they're allowed now, there's, it's within a political framework, and that's been true since the Peace of Augsburg, to, to flourish within some constraints. And this, is, this gives us more data. Now, actually, I think Sam Harris, if he were to pay attention to this, should be grateful for the spectrum of religions because it gives him data. Now, he might look at all of them and say, hooey to the bunch of them. Okay, fair enough. But if you differentiate between people in the Christian Reformed Church, from people in the Jehovah's Witnesses, from people in the Mormons. One of the interesting things about the Mormons, which comes up with Dillahunty and Harris often, and, and myself too, I'm not, I'm not a Mormon, I'm a Christian Reformed pastor, is Mormons built into their system prophecy. So before some point in the 70s, um, they had some pretty racist ideas built into their, their dogmatism. Well, they changed it. Well, how could they change it? Well, if you understand anything about LDS theology, they have, give a very high value to this prophetic role. And so the prophets, they actually have prophets of the LDS church, the prophets can change dogma and doctrine and just because they're prophets. Now, what happens in a lot of Protestant denominations is it's not that easy to change. There's more resistance to change along certain axes. So the, the case of same-sex marriage is a terrific one in this because you can see all of these denominations working on the dogmatism. And they're having all these fights about the Bible, and they're having all these fights about theology, and they're having all these fights about how can we judge things. In the Christian Reformed Church, we had 30 years of wars about women and church office, and the denomination continues to maintain a position of, of a two readings, which says that we are not going to, we are not going to, we are going to have within our denomination, we are going to allow both readings of the Bible that says women can be pastors and elders and deacons, hold official position in the church, and churches that do not permit that can continue to be members in good standing in the denomination. And, and this has gone back and forth. And a lot of progressivists have imagined, well, the complementarians, who are the ones that continue to say that women ought not to be pastors and priests, pastors and elders and some deacons for certain theological roles, well, we continue to have those conversations. That tribe has not gone away because that theological argument is alive and well, even though it's been debated since the 1970s. Now, now you might say, well, well, I think, well, and just read the comments section. You're going to find a diversity of opinion on that subject. But what you have is this live experiment, and that actually was built into the decision in the 1990s in the CRC. And what was the language about that? Let's see what the Spirit has to say about the subject. Well, well, what did the Christian Reformed Church mean by that language? We're going to look at flourishing. We're going to look at well, so we're going to have churches that have women pastors and women elders and women deacons, and we're going to have churches that don't have these. And we're going to, over long periods of time, see how those churches do. Now, I'm about to start a sermon series on the book of Daniel in my 11 o'clock sermon series, so this will be coming through in my rough drafts for Sundays. This is actually built into the book of Daniel. In the first chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar wants all of his slaves, in a sense, to be fed from the table of the king. Now, there's a lot of layers of what's going on in there. You should be eating meat and wine, the king will say. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will say, no, we're going to eat, drink water and vegetables. Well, why? Well, and the end of the chapter is, well, the, the Jewish boys flourished, and the others didn't. Therefore, it's kind of science, isn't it? Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar says, everyone's going to eat what the Jewish boys ate. These experiments are running all the time. And that's why when I listen to Dillahunty and Harris talk about religion, I think, you don't know enough religion. You know, Dillahunty, you maybe were a Christian, 
but you didn't read your Bible well enough. Because that, in fact, is built into the book of Daniel. And this is what Peterson says. Peterson says this is actually built into religion. And so what you have with religion is this multi-generational experiments going all the time at an, increasing, at an incredibly granular level by which we work on well-being and flourishing. But then again, you have the question, well, where's the goal? Well, this gets tricky because Delahunty wants to say, well... In a secular society, the goal is within the box. That's true. Should the goal be within the box? And that actually is the debate that all of these people are having. Because Brett Weinstein will say, well, what about, isn't it true that some communities do well because they have goals outside the box? Miroslav Volf makes exactly the same point in the Bosnian Wars. People can stop killing each other because... They believe a passage that says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And what that means is, I don't need to get blood on my hands in order to do justice against this group of people that I am dogmatically certain are evil. I can withhold judgment and leave it to God. That is an advantage built into the system that keeps us from killing. So, religion is the longest continual conversation we've had about goals. Contra Sam Harris and Matt Delahunte, it's always being updated. Religions modulate the pace of change with variable dogmatisms. We observe these variables and continue to, through conversion, evaluate and appropriate. In fact, Sam Harris is talking about conversion in, in one lecture as it's a horrible thing, and another lecture as if it's a great thing, conversion is actually part of the variability and the process by which we're always doing this work. Heresy. Read Alistair McGrath's book, Heresy. Heresy is the same process. It's a Darwinian process in many ways, and we're always working on it. And the truth is, the more religious groups out there, the more data we have, the more history we have, the more data we have from history, the more data we have to work on this. And, and that's why I think Peterson is offering so much more than Harris, because in a sense, Harris is saying, close the books, live in the moment, think for yourself. He's also saying, be rational. I'm saying, if you want to be rational, get as much data as you can and keep talking about it. Now, remember, Peterson is working from below. Peterson is accommodating the entire process from below, which satisfies our current bias, which is secular culture and scientific bias. He takes an abstractionist and secularist approach by not participating in a tradition, but standing apart from one. And again, in terms of strategy, we've had a number of conversations whole bunch of atheists might not listen to Peterson if he went to church. So maybe it's good if Peterson doesn't go to church. Maybe it's good if Peterson continues to live as if God is real and so on and so forth. But what's ironic is that on one hand, Peterson keeps saying, all this stuff is built into us and it's deep, so deep into us. And we represent it with drama, with our actions, in participation in, in these communities. But yet Peterson stands apart from them. Now, one of the big issues that we're going to continue to come back to is language, because we are language modernists. Now, supernaturalists, again, I don't like that term. If you've listened to my past videos, you know why. Supernaturalist language and imaginaries are asserted representations of the fully fleshed out systems that articulate goals. Let me read that again. Supernaturalist language and imaginaries are representations of the fully fleshed out systems that articulate goals. You shall not kill, and it's wrong to kill, and God is going to stand in judgment against those who murder, are all, in some degrees, corresponding sentences. They are all representations of something. C.S. Lewis is going to say of the Tao. Okay? They are all representations of it. Now, the fact that some have representations that include a divine deity and some have representations that don't doesn't mean there isn't equivalence in there. Now, I know this is going to start pinging certain religiously dogmatic troops that I'm running into dangerous territories, that I'm giving up my Christian exclusivity. This is exactly the problem that a number of Christians have had with C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man 
I don't think that's true because the Tao is not really God. All right? God creates the Tao like God gives the law. But how we language these things are representations of these things. And in a sense, like a Donald Hoffman way, we don't have access to the things themselves. They're always mediated by something. And, and actually, if you look at, if you look at, um, oh, what's his name? Fry's, Northrop Fry's first lecture on the Bible and literature. Christianity uses translations, and there's something deeply within that that says, well, if you're a Muslim, you say, well, you have to learn Arabic so you can read the Torah, not the Torah, you have to learn Arabic so you can read the, the Quran, because once it's out of Arabic, it's not really the Quran. Christianity has always, in a sense, had this Donald Hoffman approach built into it, because the Bible for much of the New Test for much of the early church was the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And as Christian ministers, we're always dealing with translations and variable languages. And, and as Peterson says many times, it's it's similar to the language thing. How do how does language relate to reality? Well, languages are representations, they're they're signifiers, they're signs, and note in a network might get into some of this stuff. But, but this is what we're dealing with. And, and so when Christians talk about God, well, there's tons built into that. And now Harrison Dillahunty will say, well, there's no reference to that, so you ought to give up that language. Yeah. Well, they will also in other times admit that they can't know whether or not there's a reference to it. So they can't really make that determination. But you understand here the way language is working. So one person says, God says, thou shalt not kill. Another person says, killing is wrong. A secular atheist says, killing is wrong. There's an equivalency to those things. They're not identical. There are aspects to the God talk that aren't necessarily built into the other, but there's connections within them. And this is why we're able to have conversations and come to all kinds of agreements on all kinds of levels politically, socially, in terms of having relationships and friendships, because there's so much built into this world. Now, Sam Harris tries to do this with well-being, but will always be limited by individual identity, communities, or universal death. This is, this is part of the limitation, I think, of Sam's language game. And I think Peterson is right that a fuller, older, richer language game that includes God actually has more power in it. A little later, Sam Harris will say, yeah, but if you don't believe it, it won't have that power. And I agree with Sam Harris on that. You've got to actually believe it. Well, how do I believe it if I don't believe it? Well, then you're going to probably have to manage the elephant. Then you're going to have to spend time with people who believe it then you're going to have to immerse yourself in that world of belief. You might say, well, well, how can I do that? Well, that is the church. That is the reason for the church. That is the purpose of the church. You don't have Christians without the church because if left to our own devices, we're just sheep without a shepherd. There's another way of talking about it. The system always struggles. Sam Harris and Delahunty's system always struggle with death, again, because of their philosophical framework. Because in many ways, philosophical frameworks afford but also limit. And you will hear, when you listen to Jordan Peterson and Matt Delahunty have their conversation, Delahunty says, death is better than life. And Peterson says, how do you know that? Well, 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 of course, because unless I have well-being, you know, unless I have being, I can't have well-being. Ah, but there are assertions built under that too, that you're not really facing. Because it might be that your systems actually do better if the frame of death, individual death, community identity death, and universe death isn't there. What religious frames have afforded is a far richer thing within to live. And what secularists do with their imminent frame, with their buffered self, self is they cut that off and it may be that, here's, here's the thing, in a sense, 
Harris and Delahunty want to make, the, when Brett Weinstein pushes Sam Harris on, has religion always been a liability? Sam Harris isn't willing to say that. Well, now you're going to have to defend why in the 20th century or the 21st century did it suddenly become a liability? How do you know that now is the best time to give up that language game? That's an assertion that is up for debate. Because what we've seen, and what I would say, is that the fuller, richer religious language game offers far more variables both to afford the ongoing live experimentation that actual living religious communities are doing and in terms of our imagination to afford the kinds of behavior that all of us, almost all of us can agree are noble and heroic. See, people must inhabit their representations. We do it physically in clothing and architecture. And, and Peterson is right. It, you can't just dismiss the songs in the buildings. No. We inhabit it. We express it. That's why we go through history and we look at architecture and clothing and all of these things because our cultures are built into them. We do it socially in culture and moral practice. Go and live in another country with a very different culture from your own and be forced to learn that culture. You will see that all of these representations have deep, deep roots into history. The stuff doesn't go away. Generally speaking, I can walk into another Protestant church that calls themselves non-denominational, or maybe they'll just hide their denomination. If I sit and listen to the pastor, or if I look at the materials in their lobby, or I talk to the people in the group, I can suss out maybe where they went to seminary, who their favorite celebrity pastors and theologians are, the theological biases of their materials. Why? Because I know this community and things don't pop out of thin air. They grow up from the bottom. We do this storily in meta narratives. This is why we have this thirst for Harry Potter and Star Wars and, and Sam, Sam Harris's daughter, daughters love Batgirl and Peterson gets really annoyed at that point in Vancouver too and says if 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 it weren't for the fact that these authors are are leveraging and embodying these archetypes in story your daughters wouldn't be attracted to them and that's just not this isn't arbitrary it all has history this is a powerful engine for delivering felt meaning at a communal level and this is Jonathan Haidt's major contribution he says Atheists, maybe the reason there are so few of you throughout history is that your project is a dead end. And, and in fact, people are making this argument with respect to the, the non-religious in society that, in fact, they actually don't reproduce. And who inherits the earth? Those who reproduce. And, and so this... That there are going to be consequences to living in the moment well-being that we might not imagine, especially if all you're looking at is what's right in front of you. And if you look back over history, again, I would read um, a table well set, a history of the Oneida community. And they had eugenics being practiced. They had free sex. They had some elements of Christian tradition. They had an authoritarian structure. It's a fascinating book. But did they reproduce? Did the community die? Did their identity system die? Did their ideas die? It's better that ideas die than flesh and blood people die. We all know that. We work on that assumption. This is a powerful engine for delivering felt meaning in a communal level. It's an evolutionary adaptation, I think all three of them would say. So you're leaving it on the table? You're walking away from it? Is that such a good idea? I have five kids. Sam has two. Now, whether my all, all my kids will follow my influences, we'll see in the long run. But I've already got you beat. Set five to two, Sam. And uh, to get back to Jordan Peterson's multi-factor authentication, Jordan Peterson has an idea, which which he actually, when he was in Sacramento and talked to... Um, gave his book tour in Sacramento, he answered the resurrection question and answered it in this way, that there are multi-factor authentications. How to evaluate that which is most real? Seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, scaling over time and population. 
when, when Jordan Peterson says you can't just dismiss the Bible, just Google how many copies of the Bible are existing in the world and look at the number two book. The number two book is Chairman Mao's Red Book. How many people do you know have a copy of Chairman Mao's Red Book on their shelf? How many of you wish to follow it? The book is a dead end. The Bible continues, you know, as Christianity grows in China and India, that num those numbers are just going to keep growing. And Peterson looks at that and says, you can't just throw this out. You're going to have to contend with it. And if you might try to dismiss it, well, you can dismiss it all you want. Vanderclay has five kids. You have two. The next generation is going to be five to two Vanderclays versus Harris's. At least Sam Harris's. There's lots more Harris's than Vanderclays. But but there's this multi-factor analysis that that you want to look at, and and it's a rational argument. You know, is it coherent across thoughts and evidence? And in fact, the more aspects it's real on, the chances are the more true it is. And the system with the most factors is probably the most real and the most reliable. It becomes it gets better on every level. Now I'm dealing with First John in my adult Sunday school class, and some of you have asked about. Well, can we look at your sermons and your Sunday school class? Yeah, go to my church website. You can find, we, we do stream my Sunday school and the sermons on Facebook Live. And I keep my sermons and my Sunday school lessons on a different channel than this channel. And you can find that the link to that channel below. But what's interesting is if you look at the book of First John, which some imagine might be kind of a book written after the Gospel of John to clarify the book because... Certain people with their philosophical biases are, are reading the Gospel of John in a rather Gnostic fashion. The, the, the letter of 1 John comes across, look how evidential this is. That which is from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked at, which we have touched with our hands. John is saying, I believe in the resurrection because I saw him. And, and there's a lot of stories about you know, leaving your body when you die and going up to be in heaven or, or just disappearing when you die or getting reincarnated. And John is saying, I saw the guy, I saw the guy with my eyes. And, and that which is most real, see, this is my, in a sense, ontological argument for the physicality of the resurrection that if the resurrection is the crux of history, then Jesus had to rise. Now you might say, well, if the resurrection is, is, isn't real, then it's all a bunch of hooey, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And this is why I believe the resurrection was physical and why I think that's actually essential to Christianity and to the future of the world and to the assertions of new heavens and new earth. And if you want more information, read, um, read N.T. Wright or listen to some of his stuff because he talks about this very well. Another, and, and this is exactly where Lewis goes with his chapter, The Grand Miracle. And the he, Grand Miracle. This, this is, there's C.S. Lewis doodles, and you can find this. I'll, I'll play a little bit of the first part because it addresses it. And, and people say, well, but what if we just have the story? That gives us the goal for morality. Okay, but to whatever degree we lose a factor, the story becomes less true, which is why Miracles and history are so foundational for Christianity. By C.S. Lewis. One is very often asked at present whether we could not have a Christianity stripped, or as people who ask it say, freed from its miraculous elements. A Christianity with the miraculous elements suppressed. Now it seems to me that precisely the one religion in the world or at least the only one I know, with which you could not do that, is Christianity. In a religion like Buddhism, if you took away the miracles attributed to Gautama Buddha in some very late sources, there would be no loss. In fact, the religion would get on very much better without them, because in that case, the miracles largely contradict the teaching. Or even, in the case of a religion like Mohammedanism, nothing essential would be altered if you took away the miracles. You could have a great prophet preaching his dogmas without bringing in any miracles. They are only in the nature of a digression or illuminated capitals. But you cannot possibly do that with Christianity because the Christian story is precisely the story of one grand miracle. 
the Christian assertion being that what is beyond all space and time, what is uncreated, eternal, came into nature, into human nature, descended into his own universe and rose again, bringing nature up with him. It is precisely one great miracle. If you take that away, there is nothing specifically Christian left. There may be many admirable human things which Christianity shares with all other systems in the world, but there would be nothing specifically Christian. Conversely, once you have accepted that, then you will see that all other well-established Christian miracles are part of it, that they all either prepare for, or exhibit, or result from the Incarnation. And just as every natural event exhibits the total character of the natural universe at a particular point in space of time, that's right there is Peterson's argument. Everything that is true expresses the universe. And so the way you find the truth is have the most variables correlate. So it's a correspondence version of truth. The rationalist should like that. But it's it goes beyond that which we can capture. And this is essentially C.S. Lewis's argument in his book, Miracles. And this chapter is found in his book, Miracles. So every miracle exhibits the character of the Incarnation. And now, if one asks whether that central grand miracle in Christianity is itself probable or improbable, of course, quite clearly, you cannot be applying Hume's kind of probability. You cannot mean a probability based on statistics, according to which the more often a thing has happened, the more likely it is to happen again. Certainly, the Incarnation cannot be probable in that sense. It is of its very nature to have happened only once. But then, it is of the very nature of the history of this world to have happened only once. And if the Incarnation happened at all, it is the central chapter of that history. It is improbable in the same way in which the whole of nature is improbable because it is only there once, and will happen only once. So one must apply to it a quite different kind of standard. I think we are rather in this position. Supposing you had before you a manuscript of some great work, either a symphony or a novel, there then comes to you a person saying, here is a new bit of the manuscript that I found. It is the central passage of that symphony, or the central chapter of that novel. The text is incomplete without it. I have got the missing passage, which is really the centre of the whole work. The only thing you could do would be to put this new piece of the manuscript in that central position, and then see how it reacted on the whole of the rest of the work. If it constantly brought out new meanings for the whole of the rest of the work, if it made you notice things in the rest of the work which you had not noticed before, then I think you would decide that it was authentic. That is, in a sense, what happens when people convert. They come to a judgment, okay, and they stake their life on it, they stake their actions on it, they stake their reputation on it, and they say, this new answer gives meaning to the rest of my life. And, and, and now I'm going to inhabit it. And, and that's, and Peterson says, well, sometimes it just happens at the little belief level. But sometimes it happens all the way down deep. On the other hand, if it failed to do that, then, however attractive it was in itself, you would reject it. Now, what is the missing chapter in this case, the chapter which Christians are offering? The story of the Incarnation is the story of a descent and resurrection. When I say resurrection here, I am not referring simply to the first few hours or the first few weeks of the resurrection. I am talking of this whole huge pattern of descent, down, down, and then up again. What we ordinarily notice the hero's journey, call the resurrection being just, so to speak, the point at which it turns. Think what that descent is. The coming down, not only into humanity, but into those nine months which precede human birth in which, they tell us, we all recapitulate strange, pre-human, sub-human forms of life, and going lower still into being a corpse, a thing which, if this ascending movement had not begun, would presently have passed out of the organic altogether, and have gone back to the inorganic, as all corpses do. One has a picture of someone going right down and dredging the sea bottom, 
One has a picture of a strong man trying to lift a very big, complicated burden. He stoops down and gets himself right under it so that he himself disappears. And then he straightens his back and moves off with the whole thing swaying on his shoulders. Or else one has the picture of a diver stripping off garment after garment, making himself naked, then flashing for a moment in the air and then down through the green and warm and sunlit water into the pitch-black cold freezing water, down into the mud and slime, and then up again, his lungs almost bursting, back again to the green and warm and sunlit water, and then at last out into the sunshine, holding in his hand the dripping thing he went down to get. This thing is human nature, but associated with it all nature, the new universe. And now, as soon as you have thought of this, this pattern of the huge dive down to the bottom, into the depths of the universe and coming up again into the light, everyone will see at once how that is imitated and echoed by the principles of the natural world. The descent of the seed into the soil, and its rising again in the plants. There are also all sorts of things in our own spiritual life where a thing has to be killed and broken in order that it may then become bright and strong and splendid. The analogy is obvious. In that sense, the doctrine fits in very well. So well, in fact, that immediately there comes the suspicion. Is it not fitting in a great deal too well? In other words, does not the Christian story show this pattern of descent and reascent because that is part of all the nature religions of the world? We have read about it in the Golden Bough. We all know about Adonis and the stories of the rest of those rather tedious people. Is not this one more instance of the same thing, the dying God? Well, yes, it is. That is what makes the question subtle. What the anthropological critic of Christianity is always saying is perfectly true. Christ is a figure of that sort. And here comes a very curious thing. When I first, after childhood, read the Gospels, I was full of that stuff about the dying God, the golden bough, and so on. It was to me then a very poetic and mysterious and quickening idea. And when I turned to the Gospels, never will I forget my disappointment and repulsion at finding hardly anything about it at all. The metaphor of the sea dropping into the ground in this connection occurs, I think, twice in the New Testament. And for the rest, hardly any notice is taken. It seemed to me extraordinary. You had a dying God who was always representative of the corn. You see him holding the corn, that is, bread, in his hand and saying, This is my body. Corn for the English means grain for you Americans. And from my point of view, as I then was, he did not seem to realize what he was saying. Surely there, if anywhere, this connection between the Christian story and the corn must have come out. The whole context is crying out for it. But everything goes on as if the principal actor, and still more those about him, were totally ignorant of what they were doing. It is as if you got very good evidence concerning the sea serpent, but the men who brought this good evidence seem never to have heard of sea serpents. Or, to put it another way, why was it that the only case of the dying God, which might conceivably have been historical, occurred among a people, and the only people in the whole Mediterranean world, who had not got any trace of this nature religion, and indeed seemed to know nothing about it? Why is it among them the thing suddenly appears to happen? The principal actor, humanly speaking, hardly seems to know of the repercussions his words and sufferings would have in any pagan mind. Well, that is almost inexplicable, except on one hypothesis. How if the Corn King is not mentioned in that book because he is here of whom the Corn King was an image? How if the representation is absent because here at last the thing represented is present? if the shadows are absent because the thing of which they were shadows is here. The corn itself is in its far-off way an imitation of the supernatural reality. I'm going to leave it there, and you can listen to the rest of it. There's part one and part two. But I wanted to stop there with the idea of representation. Because what we're really getting at when we get into... It might happen next week because I've got a very busy weekend. When we get into the the abolition of man what we're really getting into is what i'm going to call a sacramental view of the world 
that when we see the waterfall, and we say the waterfall is sublime, in a sense we're seeing through the physical physicality of the waterfall into the glory that is behind it. it, it in, in a sense, we are, we are penetrating. That's what we are referring to when we say the waterfall is sublime. We don't mean that it's pretty. Pretty, well, that's, I'm having an emotional experience of, of beauty. Well, you probably are. But that emotional experience of beauty is, is because I am witnessing something that is real and profound. Now, you might say, well, yeah, but the squirrel runs in front of the waterfall and the squirrel doesn't know it's sublime. Well, first of all, you'd have to say, how do you know the squirrel doesn't know that it's sublime? If you lived by the waterfall, you'd walk past it all day long, too, and because you have other things that you're paying attention to. But this is the question. And, and the, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth, they pour forth speech. Well, can we hear that speech? Well, that's the question. If there's, if there's a there there, and and so again, Del Hunty wants to say, well, well, it all depends on your goal. Morality depends on your goal. Well, if your goal is personal well-being, that I get what I want, that then is your God. But if there are other goals, if there are goals that transcend me and my tribe and my agendas, if in fact, this is where you get into the simulation, because... I'm, again, I'm not arguing that the world is a simulation. I'm arguing that there is a creator, and that creator has design and intent, and the creator brings goals to the enterprise. And those goals in the enterprise, just like any program that we might write, get built into the structure of the program. Natural theology is trying to figure out some of those goals from below. And there's a big debate if you look at Michael Roos and John Lennox on Unbelievable. A number of people have said, oh, you should treat that video. Well, if I have time. Because it's a great debate, and it's a, it's a wonderful video to watch. But, but that gets into the, the fideism. Is, is natural theology actually a productive project? And we're going to leave that idea alone, partly because I think it's worthwhile talking about. But then again, I'm a Calvinist. Well, what does that mean? I mean it means that, in many ways, the question of and, and this will come out in a conversation if uh, if an individual wants to put this conversation on. He's still debating. We've had the conversation already. But how do we know for who gets the proper goal? Because depending on the proper goal has everything to do with what you do. Because if you're a Nazi and your goal is racial purity, then extermination of the Jews is rational. If you're a Soviet and your goal is material equality, then... You know, destroying the Kulak farmers in the Ukraine is rational, even at the cost of starving your population. If you're Sam Harris and the goal is happiness equality or progressive maximal happiness equality, understood as well-being, this elastic term, then your goal is, you know, getting rid of religion. But but the goodness of something is always dependent on the goal, as Delahanty says. And so what religions do are these the longest conversations we've ever had to try to get at from below what the goal is. And what C.S. Lewis is saying in The Grand Miracle, the goal comes down. And you can hear John Lennox in that conversation with Michael Roos says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except my be. Well, what does he mean by come to the Father? Well, what is God? Well, God one and God two. God is, God is the goal of everything here. And so in God, there is everything. Okay. And I'm not saying that in a pantheistic way, but God is more than enough. And, and so that's why some of the representations have our goal as in medieval times, the beatific vision of just looking on God. Some articulate, some representations, let's say the new heavens and the new earth or C.S. Lewis's last battle, the goal is life in the new creation. Now you might say, well, there seems some tension between the beatific vision of, of, but now pay attention, with all of these representations, there are all these subtle implications that may not hold because you have to look at the focus of the representation. The focus of the representation of the beatific vision is that God has our complete attention. 
But then when we represent that in the only ways we know how, we imagine all kinds of people with bodies looking at God. And you'd say, well, if that happens over time, then we all get fat and lazy, becomes Wally, us sitting in recliners, you know, just feeding off of God. Well, the problem's in the representation. And, and those problems are due to our limitations of representation, just like what, what, what Don Hoffman so shows in terms of problems of representation, because we're always dealing with representations. That's how we deal with the, with the physical world. We have to represent it somehow. We, our eyes are representing and my hands are representing this bookshelf in this way. But we know that there are, you know, that there are, atoms and particles and molecules and all of that stuff underneath we know that in a different way and so we have different representations but the representation we have right now is this right here we have the same problem with all the christian stories and and that's why our capacity to participate in the future is not dependent on our capacity to articulate the story and all of our representations will be tricks and hats and reductions because we can't adequately represent it because we are just mere small human beings. All right. I'm going to end it there. We're, um, we're knocking on the door of two hours here and I got a lot I got to do today. And I wasn't even going to do this video today, but I just started working on it and I need a 12 step program to stop making videos. Anyway, uh, there it is.